so I'm glad that you saw the video. Reason TV did absolutely great stuff during both of the political conventions. And that gives a sense of something that I'm not sure that you really saw a whole lot of uh, during the conventions if you're sort of watching it on CBS News or other things. Frank Rich, uh, who's no s great friend of libertarianism or the Tea Party or Republicans or me or anybody else, um, he spent uh, his time during the Republican convention enmeshed in non-traditional, non-left of center media. Uh, and his comment was, if you, you know, Surprisingly, the Republican convention was fascinating with very important philosophical and ideological battles being waged. And if you wanted to find out about it, you couldn't just read the newspaper. You'd have to go to places like Reason. Uh, and he was highlighting our coverage, including what we did there. I want to talk a little bit about those battles uh, at the convention. I've been covering those things since uh, 2000, both the parties, major party conventions. I've never seen anything like what happened uh, at the Republican convention this last time. This is, I think, on the uh, final day, the coronation day. Um, this is a protest. They're holding up a little yellow sign saying grassroots. Um, but this was a spontaneous protest after, after uh, um, uh, basically two or three days of the Republican establishment putting its boot in the neck of the Ron Paul movement, the Tea Party movement, the Liberty movement, these sort of overlapping groups of people who I think became a lot better friends during the Republican uh, convention. Um, this is some of the uh, quotes that I got uh, just from that uh, balcony protested. We were railroaded. This is the shot heard around the world. We are absolutely not leaving this party. This is my party. I've never seen so much emotion among people. There are people in tears. These are a group of people who are so much more passionate. I mean, the, the standard kind of Repub Republican or Democratic uh, convention attendee is, and excuse me for those of you who have been an attendee and a delegate, they're a little, they're kind of freaks of nature, just a lot of like suspenders and pins and over enthusiasm and funny hats and you're not going to get a lot of, of passionate dialogue about, about uh, changing the process. These people trended to be, uh, compared to the rest, very young, very, very well informed, it's a lot of 30 year olds, 20, you know, 28 year olds. Um, they tend to be more female, tend to be more minority. Um, uh, sort of the grassroots uh, upstarts. And they kept saying after all these things happened to them, which I'll get into in a second, we're not leaving, this is my party, even though they just kicked me in the face. Um, Bill Paulson, who's a Minnesota delegate here, um, said he was on the uh, rules committee that was uh, going through some of these things. One thing to understand about the power grab is that it bypassed a deliberative four-year process. They're trying to control the process. They don't want to see another Ron Paul, but they also don't want to see another Rick Santorum. The establishment freaked out because untraditional people rose up and they had to deal with them, and they didn't like them, and they didn't like their arguments, and they didn't like the people. The Ron Paul delegations took over uh, and got their people involved, especially in caucus states, um, and started getting involved in the machinery of the parties in these states, and they wanted to go and they wanted to nominate him um, on the floor. What they did, actually, uh, instead, uh, is just change the rules seriously at the last minute. Uh, going in, you were supposed to have five states nominate you to have your nomination read from the floor. Ron Paul actually got six, and so they changed the rules so you have to have eight. Um, and uh, I, I think the eight rule didn't actually apply to the convention. He passed the five rule, um, the five state rule, and when the six state read him out, the, uh, the, the chair of the of the proceedings just wouldn't read people who were saying that they were nominating Ron Paul. They just refused to sit them. Uh, they changed rules, this four-year deliberative process, so that the chairman of the party could just, whenever they want to, change the rule overnight. As you saw in the video, they refused to seat various disloyal delegates and, uh, and other things. And this is all an attempt to get rid of or to control the grassroots. Procedurally, all, everyone who had played by the rules, who learned these arcane caucus delegation strategy, you have to sit in the next meeting and the third meeting from next Wednesday. They learned these arcane parliamentary procedures better than all of the existing politicians. And so because they learned the rules so well, they had to change all those rules. So they wouldn't have as many Ron Paul people and Tea Party people. But meanwhile, if you were in the arena looking at the people who were giving primetime speaking slots and who were drawing the most rock star like applause there, with few exceptions, they were Tea Party politicians who went up against the establishment. This was an interesting um, 
a quote from Ted Cruz, who's now kind of a darling, uh, an up-and-comer in the conservative establishment, but he was also running against the uh, Republican establishment earlier on. Um, he gave this speech in which he very studiously avoided using the phrase Tea Party, which was almost not uttered once on the podium because people were walking on eggshells. Since 2010, something extraordinary has been happening, something that has done found of the chattering class. It began here in Florida in 2010, in Utah, Kentucky, Pennsylvania. All of those places are where candidates who were uh, not supported by the Republican establishment uh, went up and first faced down the GOP establishment and then won elections. So you got Marco Rubio, Mike Lee, who's an outstanding senator, Rand Paul, who uh, we'll talk about a little bit more later, and Pat Toomey. Ted Cruz became one of those people. I don't like Ted Cruz as much as I like a Rand Paul out there, but he's worlds better than what has been the modal kind of big government Republican for a long time. And so they know, the Republican establishment knows this is where the, the, all the juice is. These are the people that are connecting with the passion that has been bubbling up uh, it kind of in a revulsion against bailout economics, against Obamanomics and Obamacare. They know that's where the future is. They're still scared of it. They want to control it. They still want to highlight. So this is really great tense moment. And I think right now this is the national political story that is the most interesting. And granted, that's a pretty low bar, generally speaking, with the state of our national politics. But it's this conflict that you see play out, this battle for the soul of the Republican Party between people who are actually interested in cutting the size of government and kind of an establishment that is more scared. So how are these kind of factions different? Um, what you'll find is that the kind of, if you want to call them Rovian Republicans, Ro Republicans, they still, even in 2013, even after fiscal cliff, debt ceiling, all these talks, after the rise of the Tea Party movement, after public poll after public poll showing that the uh, population wants to cut spending and not raise taxes, um, they still don't want to name a single thing that, uh, that the government can cut. Uh, I think Karl Rove had a piece or a quote in the Wall Street Journal earlier this month or uh, in January saying, well, Here's the strategy. Let's just uh, cut the things that Obama has proposed cutting so then we can blame it on him. They're terrified, Republicans are, of naming anything that they can cut because they think that they will lose elections. Um, and that's why you saw Mitt Romney uh, go through all these gymnastics to, to say, of course, we need to balance the budget. Just we, of course, can't touch really uh, Medicare or uh, military spending. And I'm going to protect your Social Security. But we're going to balance that budget. And also, I'm not going to tell you anything that I'm going to cut um, at all. He said that in an uh, interview to the Weekly Standard. Uh, that's sort of the rogue Republican, the modal. These new people, the Rand Pauls of the world, the Mike Lees, they campaign on entitlement cuts, on the long-term fiscal crisis. They can't wait to volunteer what they're going to abolish next. Um, this hasn't happened. This is something that we haven't seen. I was talking to uh, Matt Kibbe earlier. I'm still in shock two plus years later uh, from Rand Paul's first day on the Senate floor when he stood up and said first to his Democratic colleagues, you're going to have to change uh, we're going to have to reform entitlements. You just can't afford it. It's going to bankrupt the country. Uh, deal with it. And then he turned to his Republican colleagues and as a Republican said, you're spending too much money on the military. You can't be serious about cutting government unless you look at the military. I just hadn't heard that from a Republican I, you know, in my lifetime or from in whatever I remember from. That is the modal position of these new people, including a new wave that just came in office, people like Thomas Massey in Kentucky. Justin Amash, who uh, has been in for now uh, his uh, second term. So they actually want to name things that they're going to cut. They are talking about foreign policy in a way that we haven't seen. Um, and they tend to vote no. Um, these are the people who didn't really vote for the fiscal cliff. Uh, they're not fans of TARP. They're not fans of Medicare Part D and a lot of things that uh, Paul Ryan, who is otherwise a, a, a very interesting and good politician, would tend to vote yes on. Um, and this faction is growing it's growing in influence. Uh, it's growing in combativeness. Uh, since the election, there's been a, a bunch of different forums on the future of conservatism and wither the party and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, I think the National Review just hosted a big National Review Institute. I took part in one in Commentary Magazine 
kind of neocon magazine, uh, which I surprisingly, surprisingly uh, said that libertarianism is a pretty good idea. Um, but uh, there's about 50 commentators in this thing, and it was very interesting to note how many of them were grappling one way or the other about libertarianism being at the heart of what we either need to do or not do. Um, two representative quotes, although there are about a third of the people who participated in this were talking about this in one way or the other. Jonah Goldberg uh, said that the key is to revive conservatism's libertarian brand. Um, he's been talking about how uh, they need to, conservatives need to use federalism to start talking about the drug war in particular and gay marriage and some other issues. David Brooks, a great old friend of, uh, of mine, uh, talked about how what we really need to do is combat freedomism, which is great. He's on the wrong side of freedomism, uh, which he thinks is has taken over uh, Republican thought now. It's the uh, elevation of freedom as the ultimate political good. It's just uh, terrible. Um, so you have people who are afraid of and hear the hoofbeats of a more libertarian-based kind of philosophy and those who see that as kind of a way to get uh, republicanism both more rooted in cutting spending and meaning it uh, for the first time in a generation and also as a way to approach issues, um, more social issues or more socially seen issues like uh, even immigration. So it's, it's fascinating to note that some of the people who are leading on comprehensive immigration reform, which you know is not necessarily going to be something that I'm going to uh, support when it's in its final legislative form, but who are seeing we need to approach this differently are Marco Rubio, our Jeff Flake, who's now in the Senate, who's a great Arizona senator. Um, so this conflict is Fascinating to watch. We covered very closely at Reason and will be um, as long as, as we've heard all morning, you know, we're in, there's the one big story that we all are facing right now. It's this sort of fiscal nightmare that faces us. It's the, the wall of debt, the entitlements that are coming down. Um, and so the question is who is creating a politics first and then hopefully policy afterwards that will begin to cut that $300 billion a year that we apparently need to cut from government just to keep pace there. Um, so watching these battle lines between these factions uh, come out is very instructive. In December, John Boehner, uh, who, as Nick has pointed out, does not have an impressive long life uh, track record on wanting to cut anything in government necessarily. Um, he purged a bunch of kind of liberty movements, libertarian leaning uh, congressmen from various committees. Justin Amash, who is probably the closest heir apparent to Ron Paul out there, um, and uh, Tim Hulskamp, and I'm sure I botched his name, from the House Budget Committee, David Schweikert from Arizona, and Walter Jones uh, uh, from the Financial Services Committee. This was just, these guys are, are a big pain in our rear ends because they won't vote for our compromises and they keep criticizing us for wanting to, or for not wanting to cut spending. Um, there is a, uh, a quote, and you can cover your uh, ears if, uh, if it's too early in the morning for, uh, for working blue, but one of the people close to Boehner said basically it had nothing to do with their philosophical differences with us, it's just that all these guys are egregious assholes. Um, which isn't true, uh, but what, I mean, they are only in the sense that they are um, actually sticking up for principles that Republicans have long talked about but haven't acted on for a long time. And so in January, Amash and these guys returned the favor. There was a, a coup you might have uh, read about or an attempted semi-pathetic little uh, challenge to Boehner's uh, speakership uh, that came from Justin Amash. He was a ringleader of this. A lot of these uh, liberty-minded Republicans either voted for each other or voted for, uh, or voted for people who weren't even in the House, but they didn't vote for Boehner. They tried to go behind his back. It's been portrayed mostly by the national media as kind of a failed and pathetic uh, attempt by people who were disorganized. I think that you can make an analogy um, to maybe some of uh, the nominations of people like Christine O'Donnell or Sharon Engel saying, yes, we'll lose, but you just heard that bullet whiz past your ear. We want to change your behavior going forward, uh, which has been a hallmark of Tea Party strategy in particular. Um, other battle lines going on, there's all these ongoing battles of uh, state uh, uh, Republican parties everywhere. Um, you had a Ron Paul a guy from Maine. Maine is a, a large source of these conflicts. Mark Willis, he uh, tried to go against Rens Priebus. They, he knew he was going to lose, but they want to know that you're being challenged by this faction right now. Um, 
Paul people run Iowa and Nevada and, bunch of, uh, and, and are very prominent in various other state delegations. I think just yesterday or the day before, a Paul loyalist got bounced from Alaska in a pretty uh, cagey way. Um, so watch these conflicts going forward. A major one is sort of symbolized between the crossroads GPSs of the world, the Karl Rove's, um, club for growths of the world, people who are using the primary process to make these fights and change the attitudes of the Republican Party. There is a big wave after the election uh, among more establishment GOP of like, we have to stop this primarying business once and for all. So we, we need to use that, our money pot to make that not happen, to uh, go after groups that are doing this. So this will be a battleground going forward because I don't think that the Club for Growth, Freedom Works, Tea Party uh, groups, I don't think that they're stopped primary. And we can uh, hear some, uh, some comments from Matt, hopefully, uh, afterwards, uh, talking about some of this going forward. Um, so another way this is manifesting is in the uh, 2016 presidential race. We don't know who's running yet, but you can, oh, well, we do know that Rand Paul is running for sure. Um, but certainly Paul Ryan is in the mix, and he's someone who, even if you hate his voting record, he did bring entitlement reform into the national discussion and deserves a lot of credit doing that. He'll be writing the House budget or you know, being a key into that as they try to advance that conversation. So he's someone who believes in fiscal conservatism regardless of how he acts. Marco Rubio, who is you know, much more interesting than Mitch McConnell, uh, certainly. Uh, Bobby Jindal is also seen as someone, and I don't know if you caught his sort of uh, ballyhooed speech that he gave the other day, which was sort of all over the map. He was talking about positioning mostly. But in the middle of all of this, he gave one of the most kind of radically libertarian things I've heard in a long time from a major politician or a purportedly major politician. If any rational human being were to create our government anew today from a blank piece of paper, we would have about one fourth of the buildings we have in Washington and about half of the government workers. Um, he also said we wouldn't have social insurance programs and other stuff. Um, so, in the sense that presidential contests are national conversations about politics and ideology and policy, it is interesting to note that, I don't know, half of the handful of people who are out there uh, being heavily considered as possible up-and-comers uh, on the Republican side are people who overlap a lot more with the libertarian-esque uh, worldview, uh, which is interesting and reason for uh, encouragement. I think. Uh, at this point, some of you who have heard me or Nick talk once or twice before might be saying, wait, aren't you the guys who are always saying that political parties are stupid and we shouldn't talk about them or get excited about them? To which I say you didn't read the whole book uh, because we uh, also talk about the ways that you can use the technologies and the strategies of independence to try to get these old husks of uh, political groupings to start being more responsive to your needs. Um, and that is exactly what we've been seeing happen uh, in great numbers in a way that I think none of us could have really predicted you know, in the middle of 2008. I, th I think I wrote one of my first editor's note columns in 2008 was about uh, uh, you know, when coalitions, political coalitions dissolve. And I kind of posited that the long um, uh, kind of coalition uh, membership between some traditional conservatives and libertarians. It had lost its mojo. It might be breaking apart. It might be reformulating. It would be really hard to have predicted at that moment that we'd see kind of a generational surge um, in, in thinking about some of these ideas. So this is, this is uh, I think, very optimistic. We're finally beginning to see maybe the first example of this happening on the Democratic side. Um, in El Paso, a guy who used to be a city councilman named Beto O'Rourke, uh, he primaried an incumbent or favored uh, Democrat against the establishment on the issue of the drug war. Um, there are going to be, I predict, Sish, that over the next uh, four years or so, we're going to see uh, kind of a disaffection from the liberal coalition as Obamanomics is again revealed to be a failure and just the usual second termitis that uh, afflicts him, afflicts everybody, um, there's going to be people peeling off. And they've been studying, as much as they hate the Tea Party, they've been studying it. The Occupy Wall Street, they studied the Tea Party. They're thinking about ways of copying those things. And 
what happens anytime both parties or, or, or the kind of governing establishment acts for a long period of time uh, to the contrary of the wishes either of a majority of the population or a majority within one of the political factions, that is inherently unstable because of technology and because of the way that people are learning how to use independence as a weapon. Um, usually, not always, usually uh, some of these issues go into a more libertarian direction. I think uh, a, a very interesting place to look for that happening in the future has to do with foreign policy and military spending. Um, so watch this space and particularly watch this man, uh, Rand Paul, who I think has been really, really uh, interesting, as the cover line says, um, in this uh, process. He has managed, he's a guy who will talk about to certain audiences things like blowback. Um, he had endorses much of his father's worldview, but he talks about it differently in such a way that he can go on Sean Hannity um, and talk about these things. He can go on uh, on Rush Limbaugh. He uh, so in 2010, right? I think right before, right after uh, the uh, Tea Party wave election happened. And I'm going to close here, and hopefully we'll get uh, comments from people who are actually in the uh, process, like John Otley and Jeff Singer and Matt Kibbe and and other people. But um, in 2010, so like, welcome to Washington Tea Party. You're great on this cutting spending, but don't you dare touch military spending. This was, a, a, uh, I think, a pretty notorious op-ed in the Wall Street Journal from Ed Fulner, president of Heritage Foundation then at the time, Arthur Brooks, self-described libertarian uh, head of American Enterprise Institute, and William Crystal, uh, a great friend of libertarianism for a long time. Um, <laughs> They just said, you know, welcome, but you're not going to touch military. Military spending is not a spending problem. I think is a near direct quote from that. Um, it is interesting to note as we look at this rise of a still minority faction then that even as the Tea Party people were given a, a bit of the back of the hand uh, in 2010 by the president of, of uh, Heritage, um, Ram Paul next week on Wednesday is going to give a major speech on foreign policy at the Heritage Institute. Um, he is not just talking to Cato, he's not just talking to us, he is trying to take these values and talk about them to a crowd that has not been very receptive to it for a while. And he's doing it and he's maintaining the respect of people who otherwise have been on the outside or who might hate his father, for example, um, which I think is very uh, an interesting and positive development. We will see where that goes. I still think that on, on, particularly on questions of foreign policy and military spending, the dominant Republican strain is not on Rand Paul's side, but he's attempting to begin an argument and articulations, which is sort of the precondition for changing minds. So, I'm optimistic in a limited way because you never look for to Washington or politicians for uh, your, uh, your salvation in the world, certainly. But the quality of conversation is changing um, in a way that is, uh, I think, grounds for at least slight optimism uh, in the Republican Party, thanks to people like that. And with that, I'll stop and take questions and hopefully hear from people who are more in it than I am.